This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the latest and freshest edition of Tiger Stock with Chirko and Company. I am your host, Vito Geronimo Chirko, along with my usual psychic and broadcast partner and fun. That is Doc from Doc and Jack, John Charles Macaroon. John, how are you doing? Vito, great to talk to you. The World Series is set. It's the Boston Red Sox and the defending National League champs, LA Dodgers, making their return to the World Series, looking to avenge their loss last season. And uh, it's going to be an interesting World Series. A lot of people right now are heavily favoring the Boston Red Sox. And when you look up and down that lineup, holy cow, I don't see many scenarios, unless Clayton Kershaw can pitch all seven games, that the Dodgers can compete in this series. I'm thinking right now, early on, and I know we're going to do a preview later in this podcast, but early on, I'm thinking, like most people, that the Red Sox are going to have a big edge. Well, at least the Dodgers have the experience, though, of being there a year ago, as you said, defending NL champs. They've made three straight NLCS appearances, six straight division crowns in the National League West. So they're postseason ready, experienced. They're ready for this challenge against the Bo Sox, who won, remember, a franchise record 108 games in the regular season. So the Bo Sox are for real. Their lineup from 1 through 9 is very deep, very tough to pitch against. But the Dodgers are led in the rotation by Clayton Kershaw, who is going Game 1 against Chris Hill of the Red Sox. Now, I want to revisit the ALCS and the NLCS because there was a couple of major talking points that I had sent you uh, last week, and they involved some plays that were a little bit controversial. On the NL side, I messaged you regarding Manny Machado and the fact that maybe he was a little bit dirty. He was called out by the Milwaukee Brewers for potentially being a little bit rough, trying to step on the foot of the first baseman, I believe, out there in Milwaukee. And then on the American League side, you had a situation. It was Game 4 the game prior to the Red Sox clinching, and I believe it was the Boston defender was going up, and Houston hit a nice, solid home run, and it was a situation in which there was a fan that maybe had a chance to stand his ground. Didn't look like he came over into the field of play. You had the Boston defender reach up, and he kind of, uh, his glove was closed, and then kind of went over, based upon what we saw in video review, went over the stands, And then uh, the umpires kind of uh, looked at it. Joe West, the controversial umpire, uh, somebody that people do know around the baseball circles based upon his calls. And obviously, it's never a good thing when you know the name of an umpire. They go to New York. They review it. And they had said that the fan interfered. But when you look at the rules, it's really weird the way they called that because based on the interpretation of the rule, if a defender's glove goes into the stands and it's not impeded by a fan, then the fan has a right to kind of stand his yeah, ground. Yeah. And so I feel like they got the call wrong. It would have tied the game up in a game in which it was very important. I think the, the Red Sox went on to win that game, and then they won the series in five games. And I do think that the decision that was made was wrong based on the rules. Well, Mookie Betts went up for the ball. He was the defender for the Red Sox. And it looked like it was almost, and for me, clearly uncatchable. He wasn't going to make the catch, Mookie Betts. And then you're right, the fan in the stands has a right to go and get that ball when it's in the stands. It was hit clearly in the stands. It's not like the fan was reaching over the fence to interfere with Mookie Betts for that ball that would have and should have went for a home run for Jose Altuve. And by the way, it was in the bottom of the first in Game 4 when the Astros were trailing 2 to nothing. So a two-run bomb, it would have been to tie it up for the Astros in Game 4, a game they needed a win. And then, as you said, the Astros did end up losing in five games to the Boston Red Sox. And in Game 4, guess what the, they lost by? 8-6. to six. It was a two-run situation in which they were down two runs, and they were not able to make it up. So it was a major call, and one in which Kate Upton got on Twitter. and She, she was fired. I love seeing her react because of her man, Justin Verlander. Her tweet went viral, and people kind of reacted to her both positive and negative. But obviously, it's a close call. A lot of people were cracking on Joe West being fat and not being able to be in position. But when you go to New York, you would expect that the league would have the rules in place and would actually see what would happen. You get a chance to slow it down. You get a chance to see exactly how the play developed. And I feel like they went to replay and still got it wrong. How is that possible, Vito? It can't be happening. And it does, it seems like, left and right with these instant replays when they go to New York to make that final call, right, to look at the play and to make the ultimate decision. And then you go to New York, as you said, Joe West made the air 
on the field. You go to New York and you're looking for an overturn of the call that wasn't out when it shouldn't have been called an out. It just was clear cut to me that in the rule book of the of Major League Baseball, you would find the one rule that tells you that, well, if the fan's not interfering in the field to play with the ball, meaning, once again, back to my point, that if the fan's not reaching over the fence to interfere with the ball for the defender trying to make the play on the ball in the playing field, well, then guess what? The fan, once again, as you said too, Doc, has the right to try and catch the ball once it's hit into the stance, meaning once it's hit into the stance, it's a home run. Should have been declared a two-run home run, once again, by Jose Altuve. Instead, it wasn't. It was declared it out on the field, and then they don't overturn it in New York, which I can't believe they did not overturn that call. Now, Vita, I want to get your sense because some people messaged us via our Twitter page at Detroit Podcast as they were watching the series, and they said, look, that's just karma for the Astros because they were accused of cheating earlier in the series. Your take on that. What was going on? What was the hubaloo for those that don't know? A lot of people kind of paid attention to the Houston Astros maybe not doing things by the book. Stealing signs. A club attendant was in the dugout supposedly stealing signs. I mean, guess what? In baseball, in all sports, but we've heard in baseball before, too, where this has been going on, right? Where people are stealing signs. And the opposition has the right to do it. But when you have a guy that's clear-cut doing it, and then I think there was a camera involved as well. And because of that, and using technology, and see, technology can be so good, right? And can work towards our advantage. Also can be used towards something that's harmful, right? That's in that's ill will, right? And I guess because it was used in a negative fashion, well, now the Astros are being called as cheaters. But guess what? Once again, goes back to my point that I already made, that this has been going on in Major League Baseball forever, the stealing of signs. And teams have the right to do it, but when you're using technology to help yourself out and stealing signs and getting that competitive advantage over your opponent, then it's wrong. Now, to revisit the National League, Kristen Yelich called Manny Machado a quote-unquote dirty player after Game 4. There was an incident in the 10th inning of the Dodgers' 2-1 victory where Machado was running through first base when his left foot hit the leg of Milwaukee Brewers' first baseman, Jesus Aguilar. And Yelich was not impressed. He was not happy and called Machado a dirty player. Now, some people will say, look, uh, Machado was trying his best efforts to um, make a play, and sometimes you got to be a little bit rough and tumble that it's not an easy sport to play baseball, and sometimes if you're in the way, hey, it could happen. What was your stance? Is Manny Machado a dirty player? Well, I think he's being labeled as such, but I view it like, well, if you're trying to break up a double play, guys are going to slide into you or into your direction, right? Into your, your view to prevent the double play from being turned. So Manny Machado and others do this on a regular basis. So it goes back to what I said about the cheating allegations directed towards the Astros. And that's been ongoing. Also, this has been ongoing to break up double plays. So does it make them dirty? I don't know because there's other guys that could be labeled dirty then as well. Just this is happening in the NLCS, so it's magnified because of that, because of the stage that it's happening on. But then there also were allegations made towards, directed at Manny Machado of him being lazy, being a lazy ball player. I agree with that more, and he's even admitted it in so many words that he is a lazy ball player. He's not going to run on everything down the first baseline to try to beat out a ground out to shortstop or third base. And that's on him. That is on him, and that's where there is some credence to it and validity to it. So I can see him being called lazy. Now, him being called a dirty player, have there been instances of him being maybe a little bit dirty, bordering on that? Yes. And, like, I know there was an at-bat by him where his bat went flying on the third baseline. Well, that's going to irk a lot of people on the opposition. So I get that where you're thinking that's dirty and he's doing that intentionally. And when you're doing it intentionally, that is dirty on the player. Okay, here's Yelich's quote that a lot of media definitely caught on to. He says, You all could see how that unfolded. Everyone has their opinion. He is a player that has a history with those types of incidents. One time is an accident. Repeated over and over again, it's a dirty play. It's a dirty play by a dirty player. I have a lot of respect for him as a player, but you can't respect someone who plays the game like that. It was a tough-fought baseball game. It has no place in our game. We've all grounded out. Run through the bag like you've been doing your whole life like everybody else does. If it's an accident, it's an accident. On the replay to us... It clearly looks like you clearly go out of your way to step on someone. It just has no place in our game. It's unacceptable. I don't know what his problem is, honestly. I've played against him for a long time. It has no place in the game. So I'll ask you. You're in the same situation. You see the play unfold. 
You going to act similarly to Manny Machado, or are you going to just, like Christian Yelich says, hey, just go to first base and handle your business? Well, Christian Yelich is talking about the play at first and him running down the first baseline. I was talking about something different, too, that he's been called out for, sliding into second base to break up a double play. Now, in regards to Christian Yelich's comments, that is dirty, because I'm not going to step on somebody's toe or foot and try to injure them. It looks like, then, it's intentional, and he's trying to hurt that first baseman. That's never a good look, and that's when you can be labeled dirty, I think, rightfully. You know, you're deserving of that dirty label. Now, when you're breaking up a double play, I don't think that's dirty. A lot of players do that and haven't been called or labeled dirty in the past. Now, running down first base and intentionally stepping on somebody's foot to almost hurt them, it looks like you're trying to hurt them. Well, that's when you're called dirty, and that's when you deserve to be labeled as dirty. So I give some credence and credibility, validity to Christian Yelich's comments in that case where he was running down the first baseline. And it looks like, yeah, he's trying to invoke harm on that first baseman. There is no place in the game for that. All right, Vito, good take. I'm looking forward to your preview of the World Series. Boston Red Sox, LA Dodgers, a lot of people are excited. Can you guess what the cheapest price is to get into Fenway for game one? Can't be cheap. $600 is the worst seat you can get <laughs> right now, man. That's expensive. That's a travesty, man. How am I going to afford that? How is any college student? Every <laughs> person right. out of college. A couple of years out of college going to afford that. Man, just have a couple beers and save the money. Just go to uh, a local watering hole and uh, go to your favorite establishment and save some money, man. You can get drunk off of like 50 bucks. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm going to go right? and get drunk and watch the game at a local establishment or at my own place rather than going to Fenway. Lovely. I mean, you know, historic, nostalgic feel there at Fenway, but i got to save bucks, man. People can't afford that. Maybe north of $100 for the cheapest ticket, but north of $600? Uh, no way, Jose, on that front. All right, Vito, let's pivot to talking about the Detroit Tigers because I was curious what your take was, what your thoughts were regarding where the Detroit Tigers go from here because it kind of looks like they're not going to be major players in free agency. There's going to be guys similar to Mike Fires and Lariano where maybe you take a fly around them, guys that you can potentially flip. But Detroit Tiger beat writer Lynn Hennig took a stab and discussed what is going on with the Detroit Tigers starting pitchers and who they may target in free agency. What would you think of the article? Well, he brought up Edwin Jackson, so when I saw that, I don't like the article right off the bat because of that. Now, there's some other guys that are more intriguing, perhaps, but Edwin Jackson, like at the front of the list for him for guys to target among starting pitchers, I don't like that at all because Edwin Jackson had a season that was unheard of for himself that nobody saw coming and that he can't repeat. It's not going to be replicated out of Edwin Jackson at his age after he's been on like 13 teams already. And then so, coming back to Detroit again, that would be like... Please, no way. I don't want that to happen. Pitch these youngsters instead Spencer Turnbull and others. Yeah, so you would rather just maybe roll with who they got instead of maybe making a splash like they did last year and getting Lariano or Fires or somebody that's uh, maybe a little bit past his prime but could contribute something, maybe taking flyers. Is that basically what we're relegated to is just guys that are going to be... Uh, available in free agency that the Tigers look at just being flyers? Is that what it's going to be? Just taking chances on guys that maybe will be successful, but no sure thing based upon what the Tigers are willing to commit financially? Well, it's what they did last offseason, too. Mike Fires and Liriano weren't splashes by any stretch of the imagination. You're taking flyers on those guys to see if they can rebound from disappointing past campaigns. Liriano aging vet. They thought maybe he could do something he did in the first half. Fires did out of nowhere. They were lucky with Fires. They got him on the cheap too. So he was a great bargain. Now they're looking for more bargains on the cheap. So you look at the scrap heap almost and you can look at what you can pick up. The likes of Jeremy Hellickson maybe. Derek Holland, the Dutch oven who bitch for the White Sox, bitch for the Texas Rangers back when the Tigers made the ALCS in 2011. He was like their ace or one of their frontline starting arms. Now he's been relegated to number four or five starter duty and Mop-up duty at times, but he did have a quality season this past season with the Giants. So maybe they bring him to Motown. Maybe they bring Hellickson to Motown. I would rather have Hellickson or Holland right off the bat, much more than Edwin Jackson, because I don't want to go down the same path as they did already with Eddie Jackson. I don't want to bring him back to Motown. What's the point of that when you can pick up somebody else on the cheap, such as Derek Holland, such as Jeremy Hellickson, who will go for a little bit more than Edwin Jackson, who I believe is 35 Hellickson will go for a little bit more than Derek Holland as well. So maybe Holland, the Dutch oven, is your man to pick up for the Tigers that can fill that void at the back end of the Tigers' rotation in 2019. Mm, yeah, it's not a situation in which you look at it and you go, yeah, there's a lot of guys out there. They're I not mean, sexy options. Right, other guys that were mentioned. Tyson Ross, age 31, uh, pitched for the Padres and Cardinals. Trevor Cahill, age 30. Brett Anderson, age 30. 
Marco Estrada, age 35. Used to be good. These guys used to be good, Doc. I mean, Brett Anderson went back to the A's and was quality. Trevor Cahill went back to the A's. These guys were cast-offs that had good seasons out of nowhere in Oakland, like Edwin Jackson, like Fires once they got him from the Tigers. So the thing is, these guys, to replicate it, you can't count on any of these guys almost, outside of maybe Jeremy Hellickson. And because you can count on him to replicate what he did last year, guess what that means for Jeremy Hellickson? He's going to go for a lot of money, and more money than the Tigers are willing to spend on a starting arm, in my opinion. Okay, is there a name that has been targeted or somebody out there that you say, well, could be somebody that's um, high-priced or somebody that could contribute or be a strong veteran leader that could come in here and be part of a clubhouse under Ron Gardenhire? Because obviously you look at it and you start looking at some of the names, you know the Tigers aren't going to be major players. But is there a name out there? Is there somebody that is coming around that you say, well, maybe uh, if he fits here in Detroit, could, could do some things and at least help them get at least back to 70 wins because another year of 64 wins would just be really tough. To, 64 wins? To endure. Three straight years, baby. Right? Three times a charm. We love that. It's a biblical number. But to answer your question, I would say two off seasons from now. Justin Verlander. You could add him potentially. How about a reunion in Motown for JV? How about adding Aaron Hicks? A nice corner outfielder can play center field, can be a leader for the offense in 2020 when the team is relevant again and starts competing at least for an American League wild card spot, perhaps. So there's guys out there, but I don't think this offseason for the Tigers to grab. Nobody's serious. You think that any of the moves we made will just be for show and that anybody that's brought in maybe could be flipped. But in the end, the amount of noise that will be made the amount of the contribution will be insignificant. Little to no noise. I mean, you can pick up Alex Avila on the cheap. You want to bring him back to Motown, Curtis Granderson back to Motown before he retires? I mean, the guy should retire. You can bring back guys that should be retiring, that maybe won't, that want to sign and make a little bit more money still before they do retire. Well, Curtis Granderson, but those guys should retire, and they bring no value and really no box office value to the Tigers. Outside of the fact that they did play for the Tigers at one time down the old English D, and maybe that is a little bit of an attraction to those that have the feeling of nostalgia towards the Tigers of past years and when they were last relevant, but those guys aren't going to bring big impact to the Tigers in 2019, nor are the Tigers looking to make that big splash for players that can make that big impact in 2019 because they're not trying to win. They're not trying to be relevant in 2019. Not trying to be relevant. I'm crushing your dreams, baby. I'm crushing everybody's dreams out there that think the Tigers can be relevant all of a sudden in 2019. Well, Vito, speaking of retreads, when I saw the news that Brad Ausmus, former Detroit Tiger manager, was on you know this interview tour with maybe the Reds and the Angels and things like that, I said, oh boy, he's likely going to get a job. I thought maybe he would land with the Reds, but in the end, he takes the job in the organization in which he was an advisor, and he's now the new manager of the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. I look at that situation, that opportunity for Brad Ausmus in L.A., and I go, Brad... Who's advising you? That team is the same as the Tigers. You're not going to win a bunch of games. They're selling people. They're potentially going to be restricted financially. Why are you going to that organization, especially in a situation in which, you know, Mike Sosha left, you're following a legend, a guy that won a title with that organization? I just don't see that being a quality fit. I see another four years of mediocrity out of the Angels. I don't see this being a real success. Am I wrong? Well, who's advising him? I'm going to answer that question as agent to make money. For himself and for Brad. The Angels aren't going anywhere. They're going to be the definition of mediocre for a while, for four to five years, five to six years, because they have so much payroll already committed to these guys like Shohei Otani, Albert Pujols, Mike Trout long term, that they have no money to spend on free agents out there that could upgrade their ball club. And they could use a starting rotation help, the bullpen help, at numerous positions on the playing field as well, you know, among position players. So they could use so many upgrades, but they can't really allocate their resources financially to too many areas because they don't have much to work with in terms of money, money to give out. So because of that, they're limited in what they can do to upgrade this ball club for the next two, three, three, four years. And I don't see this team being much more than mediocre for the next four to five seasons. Do you see him learning from his experience with the Tigers? I mean, there were a lot of things that people critiqued him on, especially the the, the bland nature in which he spoke to the media, the fact that he kind of took this, I'm the smartest guy in the room attitude. His uh, use of the bullpen was terrible. I guess the thing that a lot of people, when they critique Brad Ausmus, was he just lacked it, like the feel. It seems like every time he would pitch to a player that he thought was going to get an out, that the player would get a hit. Every time he took out a pitcher or, or significant opportunities in which he could have brought somebody else in in a, in a key situation, he wouldn't take advantage and utilize analytics to utilize the pitching staff properly. It seemed like that he was 
really inexperienced and the lack of experience as a manager really caught up to him, especially with, I think, uh, his over-reliance on veterans. And sometimes a lot of the players really didn't improve a whole heck of a lot under Brad Ausmus. So I just see a bunch of demerits. And I guess, yeah, he's a guy that's been around baseball. But you look at guys like Craig Council, you look at guys that are managing in Major League Baseball, a lot of the young up-and-comers that you see out there also have had success playing baseball, winning titles. And that's something where you look at and you go, Brad Ausmus has been a journeyman. He hasn't really been on a lot of winning teams. And he doesn't, I don't think he doesn't bring a lot to the table. He doesn't. I mean, you're already saying that clear cut without saying it. And then you did there, but you can say it in so many words. And it is clear cut a fact that he doesn't bring much to the table at this point for a young guy that's 42, 43. And he's old school for a young guy. He's in his 40s. A little bit older than you, but he still it still makes him relatively young, right? And he's old school already. He's not going to utilize analytics. So if they're thinking, oh, this guy's going to implement analytics and we're going in a new school direction that's going to embrace analytics and sabermetrics completely, Brad Ausmus isn't your man to hire. You should have just stuck with Mike Sosha. They're about the same in terms of old school and relying on guys to pitch one inning at a time. Like somebody made fun of him on Twitter saying, well, if you think he's going to embrace analytics, how about what he did with the Tigers? He had a seventh inning guy, eighth inning guy, always had to use the guy in the same role in the same inning. It's going to stay that way with the Angels. So how do they upgrade in terms of being more now fully embracing of analytics? They're not going to fully embrace analytics. It's not going to happen under the leadership of Brad Ausmus, who also, he drew a lot of detractors because of how he handled the media, as you said too, Doc, because he wasn't very personable with the media and didn't really embrace the fact that he had to speak with the media and the media couldn't relate to him. Us as fans, right? And as podcasters couldn't relate to him. And there wasn't much to work with there in terms of a personality too, which could win over some fans and over some media members. He never had that going for him. So maybe he changes in terms of that and embraces analytics a little bit more, but I don't see him completely changing his ways and becoming a different manager all of a sudden either. Now, Vito, I watch Major League Baseball Network, and sometimes you can't watch all three hours of a baseball game, three and a half hours plus. And there was talk at the way that Cora handles the Boston Red Sox, and they went in depth, and they said, look, Cora is not out there just pinching numbers. He uses them, but he also has feel. He also uh, has—they were commenting that, look, the reason why Cora has been successful is he goes by his feel. And he makes decisions like putting in some starters in the bullpen, and they were ranting and raving about the way he was making decisions in certain situations with the batting lineup and with the use of pitchers in the, the series versus the Astros. And so they, they directly said that, yeah, numbers are important, but there seems to be this divide between the, those that are old school and say, hey, trust your gut, make decisions, and guys that are strictly using advanced analytics. And they definitely pointed to Joe Madden. They said, look, yeah, it worked. But is it something where if you don't have the proper talent, if there's situations which you got to make a decision, sometimes you can look at analytics and numbers and argue yourself to death when all you got to do is just trust your gut and make decisions. So there is this divide going on even among baseball analysts. And so I definitely agree that you got to kind of be in the middle. You got to know the numbers. You got to be able to apply it. But at the same time, you know what? The manager at the Red Sox is proof, too, that you can be a guy that makes decisions based on what you're seeing live in-game. There's a fine balance. And you have to manage both ways, right? Be able to adjust based on what you're seeing in terms of matchups that aren't based on numbers. So you need both assets. Alex Cora has it down pat big time, and he can manage beautifully because of it. Because he has the knowledge of his team the composition of his team, right, and who these guys are as people. He's gotten to know them on a personal level, and he knows their flaws, right, their pros and cons. And because of that, he knows to utilize them and when to utilize them, and not just because of numbers that tell him to use this guy in this situation. So I love what Alex Cora has done. He has embraced analytics, but there is more to it. There is more to the story and more to the equation than just purely managing a ball club based on analytics. I'll give you that much, Doc, and all those out there that are naysaying analytics, Well, I'll give you this, that there are two sides to everything and to every game that you manage. You need to know the player as well and whether or not he can succeed in that given role that you're thinking about utilizing him in. All right, take our first break prior to your preview of the World Series, Boston versus the LA Dodgers. Let's take a quick timeout. We'll come back and finish off this episode of Tigers Talk with Chirko and Company. And Doc, our newest sponsor is the Legacy Football Organization, which was founded in 2009. And Legacy, by the way, guys, is the premier off-season development program in the state of Michigan, in the Midwest, and in the entire U.S. of A. 
Legacy Football provides unique platforms for student athletes on and off the field through community service, social awareness, education, and football. And some of the staffers for Legacy include a previous guest of Two Bad Hombres and MSU All-American linebacker and Super Bowl champion Greg Jones. For more information on Legacy Football, please contact National Director of Football, Justin Sassante, or go to www.legacyfootballorg.com. And Doc, our other fine sponsor is the Detroit Sports Commission, which has been bringing tons of marquee events to the Metro Detroit area since 2001, including an event that happened late in August, which I worked, the Zenith Prep Kickoff Classic. So, the Detroit Sports Commission... To find out about all of the events they are bringing to our very region, once again, the Metro Detroit area, please follow the Detroit Sports Commission on Twitter and on Instagram at DET Sports. And make sure to check out the Detroit Sports Commission's terrific website at DetroitSports.org. And back here on Tiger Stock with Chirko and Company. And it is still a disgrace to me that Brad Ausmus got that Angels job. Anyways, so we talked about the Tigers, their targets among the free agent starting pitching arms out there. And now how about the World Series? Focusing solely on that matchup, the Dodgers and Red Sox. And Doc, I'll ask you before I really dive in depth and give you guys a preview. Who do you like in this matchup and why? I'm like everybody else. I fall in line. I think that the Red Sox... Wow. When you look at that offense, it's been prolific. They won well over 100 games. They're pitching very well. Um, It's going to be interesting to see what Game 1 brings. Uh, Chris Sale, I think, versus Clayton Kershaw. It'll be an interesting matchup. I do think that if Boston can get Game 1, there's a strong chance that they can sweep the Dodgers. I just think that when you look at the matchups, it kind of sways a lot heavily in the favor of the Red Sox. They're hitting well. Uh, They got clutch hitters. They got solid pitching. Now, obviously, the question marks that a lot of people have with the Red Sox is that bullpen, uh, you know, lading situations and things like that. But when you look at it, you don't need your bullpen if you're winning, you know, and scoring a bunch of runs. So if they can hit the home run, if they can continue to be this team that goes through and handles their business, executes at a high level, I like the Red Sox in five games. Well, and they have home field, too, which helps out big time at Fenway Park, that short right field porch. Jenny Martinez, Mookie Betts can take advantage of that. They have all season long and Red Sox uniforms, respectively. And Mookie Betts, by the way, because there's no DH in National League ballparks, such as Dodger Stadium, well, guess what Mookie Betts has to do? He's going to have to play second base so Jenny Martinez can slide out there into the corner outfield and play in those games in L.A., So the thing is, the Red Sox will have their best lineup, their best hitting lineup every single game in this series, unless they decide to, but they're not. Forget about me even starting to say that. They're not going to sit J.D. Martinez. They're not going to sit Mookie Betts, two American League MVP candidates. Now, the one big advantage, in my opinion, though, that the Dodgers have on the Red Sox in this matchup is the starting rotation. The Dodgers with Clayton Kershaw. I like him over Sale, at least because Kershaw was there last year, and now he's proven that he can get it done in the playoffs a lot more than what could have been said about him going into last year's postseason. So I trust Kershaw over Chris Sale, who didn't look the finest. And, well, the finest Chris Sale in his last outing didn't bring exactly the same amount of zip on his fastball. So who knows what Chris Sale will bring to the table in this World Series matchup and head-to-head with Clayton Kershaw in Game 1. I like Kershaw in that one, and I also like the fact that the Dodgers can put out there Walker Buehler. Walker Buehler is a JV-esque pitcher, maybe a miniature Justin Verlander, and the next best thing after Justin Verlander retires, Walker Buehler becomes what Justin Verlander has been for all these years. First with the Tigers, and now most recently and currently with the Astros. So Walker Buehler is that ace prototype, I think, in the making for the Dodgers. And really, you could argue he's right up there already with Clayton Kershaw in terms of consistent success. Now, I'm going to take Kershaw over Buehler, but to have that potent one-two combo... You can't beat that man, and I think you need two strong starting arms in every single series, and especially when it comes to the Fall Classic. So the Dodgers have that in Kershaw and in Bueller, who is going in Game 3 for the Dodgers when the series does switch to L.A. 
And by the way, so it's two in Boston, three in L.A., and then two back in Boston if games six and seven have to be played. So the Red Sox, with that home field, it definitely gives them a leg up on the Dodgers. But I still think watch out for the Dodgers, and they've got a great shot to win this series. But despite all of that being said, I like the Red Sox's potent offense. I can see J.D. and Mookie Betts leading the Red Sox to a World Series championship. And what we've seen out of David Price in his most recent outing against the Astros there in the LCS, that was a mighty impressive out of Price. That was vintage David Price. If the Red Sox get that out of him, and a finer-looking Chris Sale than what Sale showcased in his most recent outing that came in the LCS, then I like that one to a duo as well. That one-two combo is a potent one then as well for the Bo Sox. And they have the leg up in terms of their lineup one through nine. And that's what I think gives the Red Sox the ultimate advantage. And I think the Red Sox win this series in a series that goes, I'm going to say goes six games. The Red Sox win it at their home ballpark of Fenway Park in game six. And I think they win this series too, despite all of us as Tigers fans out here, such as you and I, Doc. We do not want to see, I don't, well, I'll speak for myself here. I do not want to see the Red Sox win the World Series. Do not want to see that happen whatsoever. But I think despite the Tigers fans out there, Dave D, David Price, Rick Porcello, and J.D. Martinez, and Ian Kinsler, all these ex-Tigers, they're in Beantown now. I think they get it done, and they make me cry when they finally get that last out in this year's Fall Classic. Two things that the Dodgers absolutely have to have happen if they are to shock the world and win the World Series. I wouldn't say shock the world. It wouldn't be shocking the world, but go on. I think it would be shocking the world because the Red Sox are the prohibitive favorite. They got much more talent. Payroll is very bloated. And you look at it and you go, wow, across the board, I do think that the Red Sox are three times as good as the Dodgers. Three times better. Three times. Boo. Really? Yes, sir. I do think so. All that money devoted to the Red Sox and the Dodgers. The Dodgers have a big time payroll as well and a lot of talent, star talent too, on that roster. Two things they got to do in order to bring home the World Series. For the Dodgers to win, I think Kershaw and Bueller have to get it done. Those are their two most reliable starting arms, in my opinion. And then Ryu who I like a lot, who I think I'm, I'm butchering his last name, but another good arm for them that is going in Game 2 at Fenway. So the Dodgers have to get those nice starts out of Kershaw, out of Bueller, out of Ryu in the first three games, and they have to split. In the first two games at Fenway, they have to win one of those two games at Fenway and go to Dodgers Stadium with the series tied up at one game apiece. That has to happen, in my opinion, for the Dodgers to have a chance, and I think their chances of winning, now they're below 50%, but I would say it's in favor of the Red Sox, 55 to 45%, so it's not like the Red Sox, to me, are the overwhelming favorite. Because I look at the Dodgers' rotation once again, and they have the upper hand there in terms of frontline starting arms. I trust Kershaw over Sale. I like Bueller even over Price. Now, am I doubting Price and what he can bring to the table? No, not after his start against the Astros there in the ALCS. I liked what I saw to David Price, and once again, that was vintage David Price. But Red Sox, I think, are trailing the Dodgers in terms of starting rotation talent. So that gives the Dodgers a one edge. Now, bullpen, they're pretty even there. Neither has a, an extremely strong bullpen. And lineup-wise, the Red Sox have the clear-cut advantage. But the Dodgers have some bats. They do have some bats, remember, as well. And Cody Bellinger and uh, Matt Kemp and others, Justin Turner at third base, Manny Machado at short, those guys can slug the baseball, man. So these guys could go off in the series, too, and that's why the Dodgers don't say they don't have a shot. Once again, the Red Sox have the better shot. They are the favorite. They did win 108 regular season games. So they have home field for a reason. They were the best team in the American League all season long and became the best team in Major League Baseball in the regular season too. So they should be considered the favorites to win this year's Fall Classic. But once again, I think when you do a big vetoes over under, over 50% I give the Red Sox for their chances to win it all and slightly under 50 for the Dodgers to win it all. And I place their odds, the Dodgers odds, that is at 45% going into the Fall Classic. Okay, 45%. So you're saying, like myself, that the Red Sox probably are going to win the World probably, Series. Probably, but not the prohibitive and clear-cut favorites. You said prohibitive favorites? The Red Sox aren't that. Even though they won 108 regular season games. And a franchise record. That was, too, once again, for the Bo Sox. All right, Vito. Great podcast. Um, definitely excited to see how this series progresses. Um, obviously, when the series ends, we'll see who uh, walks away the World Series champion. And then we'll definitely kick off what's going to happen in the draft and things like that. Maybe we'll just take one week off like we did. Did we do that last year? I forget. We took one week off, and that was it, I believe. That's it. One yeah. Week, and I think that's what we'll do again. We'll just take a week off, let the dust settle, 
and we'll continue to do our work to bring you the best information in previewing the 2019 Tigers. Definitely going to be a bumpy ride, but we have to look at some of the talent that could be available in the draft, free agency, what the organizational philosophy is going to be, continuing to review what some players can contribute to the Detroit Tigers, and also look at you know who's going to be tasked with coming up here and handling their business. And hopefully we have a chance to do interviews and things like that. So we'll continue to bring you another season of Tigers Talk as long as Vito stays with us. I will stay with you guys, and we'll keep talking about how the Tigers can't even sniff a division crown in 2019, let alone a World Series. How about a division crown? It's not going to happen in 2019 either. And with that, Doc, to you, thanks for all the time, and thanks to all of you guys for listening to this week's episode of Tigers Talk. Adios. You can follow Vito on Twitter at Vito Jerome. You can follow the network at Detroit Podcast, and you can leave a voicemail anytime you want, 248-579-8686.